Hey, welcome to the Hold the Line podcast. Sean Foyt here. And today is, tonight is very special. We are coming to you from New York City, Times Square, in the middle of our New York City premiere for the film Super Spreader that comes out on September 29th in theaters across America. And so I'm here with two of my good buddies, Michael Malden, Josh Frainer, who produced and directed this film and pulled me into all this chaos. And I thought this would be an amazing opportunity to talk about um, why it's so important for us to, as believers, as Christians, as conservatives, to share the full story, capture for the world, world to see, and how we can really penetrate this industry of entertainment and film. You know, here we are uh, in this theater in Times Square where there's tons of movies being shown and premiered, and tonight, Super Spreader is here, which is really cool, and I feel like it's even just a prophetic picture, maybe, of what God wants to do, not just with this film, but with a lot of films uh, created and crafted and released from believers. So, where do we begin? Man, I we can begin, you know, in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> you know, I jumped on uh, with you in 2020, yeah. doing Let Us Worship in Tampa. We, with my family, we did 22 cities yeah. across America in the middle of the lockdowns, in the middle of craziness. Mm-hmm. I saw every major narrative that the media was pumping out. Yeah. I saw the opposite story taking place. Right. Yeah. I saw God doing extraordinary things and touching wow. people's lives and people to come together and love and racial reconciliation and all these things. And that story wasn't being told. I saw hope, all these things. Right. And then Vice and Showtime came to you and said, right. hey, we want to do a documentary on right. you. And we yeah. both were like, we know how they're going to tell that story. Right. They're going to make us as Christians look like the crazy Christians. We're right. out of touch with reality, you know, right. killing grandma, whatever. Right. And, and I was like, we got to tell this story, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I came across Josh, who was a filmmaker. This and young pup. Young pup. <laughs> and he had just found out about the upper room, was seeking God. And, and I saw there was just this divine connection there. And I saw, I saw he had a quality about him. Because I feel like a lot of stories told in the Christian realm haven't been done with a certain, maybe, I think we're, all of our eyes are attuned to a certain level of taste and quality because of all the yeah. content that we've seen. And right. the church has been catching up to that because we've been out of the game for a long time. And so getting him in the game, I knew it was important um, so that we could tell it at a high level. Because, you know, because when you, we were talking about doing a documentary, we were like, we got to do a baller, you know. And you got to compete with Hollywood at a quality level because the right. story's there. We've been entrusted with the greatest stories the world has ever known, the stories right. that hold the keys right. to life yeah. and human flourishing as yeah. believers. And to tell a story where the entire world was locked down and there was so much depression and hopelessness, but a story actually filled with hope and faith. Right. It had to be told. And we, and we are making history, one, bringing revival to the theater, but two, the first film to come out really in theaters as it relates to the 2020 lockdown right. of COVID. We're, right. we're, we're, hitting, we're coming out of the gates with this thing yeah. from God's perspective. Wow. Wow. And so what motivated you, John? It's <laughs> a great question. <laughs> well, I think um, for me, like, I, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but Christian films for me, I actually don't really watch a lot of Christian films. I mean, I've been in LA for 15 years and I used to work for Ridley Scott and um, some crazy filmmakers. And for me, I just wanted to tell a story. What I was attracted to was the grittiness of the story. Right. And I knew because what you were doing was controversial from a storytelling perspective, I knew that that was gonna be, it was gonna really hit, it was gonna be be interesting just to tell as a story. Um, and I had a lot of questions coming into this. I yeah. wasn't like a huge, I mean, I knew what you were doing, but right. I wasn't like just necessarily a fan. Right. So I, I was approaching it with a lot of questions that I had and walking into it, should should church and state, is, should there be a separation of church and state? Um, what's the cost of courage? Is what Sean's actually doing um, is it helpful or is it actually hurting people? And because I came to a Kerrville event, and this was back when 2020 was in full fledged, and I, I showed up wearing a mask. And I was like trying to figure things out. And that's where I started the journey with this, is just by asking the questions that I had. Um, but I wanted to do it in an honest way, or like in a thoughtful way. 
um, but also in an experiential way. I think that that's the great thing about documentaries and filmmaking is so much of the film is experiential. Like we have a whole like George Floyd rioting section where we're, we were watching hours of rioting footage and all that stuff was impacting me. And then we were also watching hours of Let Us Worship footage. And I just remember just crying or just like having tears just going through all this, like these hours of footage of just of, of his events and the Let Us Worship stuff. So I think all that to say, as a filmmaker, I have, if something, something has to impact me first. Right. And if it impacts me, I know other people, yeah. it will impact other people. So. From my point of view, I was hesitant because I could tell you were on the fence and weren't fully bought in and we had already, and I'm like, well, in real time, in real life, we're facing all kind of resistance. Yeah. The last thing I want is somebody that's not on our team yeah. telling our story yeah. because I'm like, I'm already trying to convince enough people. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't wanna try to be convincing yeah. the guy that's telling this story. So that's where I was honestly in the beginning and I was a little resistant and was talking to Michael about it. But what's interesting is I think God actually used that in your life and in my life because yeah. most of the world, especially if we, you know, like the stories God writes, I mean, like, let's just take the Bible, for example, right? The greatest book of all time, the most read book of all time, the most historically accurate book of all time. It's timeless, it's ageless, it's the word, it'll never fail. But yet, it's so real. Yeah. It's so gnarly. Yeah. It's so like, you don't just talk about how David slayed Goliath and the giant and the bear and all this stuff. You talk about how he killed a man because he wanted his wife. Yeah. yeah. You talk, you know, how he cheated and lied and stole. And, I mean, it shows the whole story. Yeah. And that's why it's so trusted. And that's why it's so uh, regarded even in, in, by institutions like Harvard and, and, and Yale and whatever, it's regarded as the greatest source of literature of all time yeah. because it, 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 it spares nothing. Yeah. And I think sometimes when it comes down to Christians telling their story in film, a lot of times it can feel in a, a not authentic Water because it's, it, it, it's like a highlight reel. Yeah. And everybody's sitting there thinking, well, I know it, it, there's no way it could have been like, no one's life is like that. Yep. Yeah. So tell me the part of your life that's probably been like my life. And so, you know, you know yep. what I'm saying? So there's a disconnect. Yep. And then on the Christian point of view, they're thinking, well, we hear, we see enough crap in the world and we deal with enough stuff. We just want to tell good stories. Right. So the, you have these competing things and I understand it. And you know, faith films are powerful right now. Yeah. I mean, people all over Hollywood, people are taking notice of faith films, yeah. you know. Um, so anyway, in my life, as it relates to that, I think it was it was powerful that we shared the story. We got raw. We got vulnerable. We, you guys, against my judgment, interviewed our trolls and our haters. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine this? Like, <laughs> these guys are using money to interview and produce comments from the people that hate us. Uh, on Twitter and, and all, all these other platforms. However, you kind of present that to the audience in some ways and let them decide. Yeah. Okay, yeah. here's what's being said. We're giving these guys room to, to share it, but yet this is what's actually happening. Right. And so where do you, what do you do with that? And well, that's where the good stuff is, right? I mean, living in that tension for me is just good storytelling. Yeah. You're not just telling one side of the story. It's not just right. a propaganda piece. It's not just a highlight reel. Right. Um, but when you think about good story or like what the stories that really move you, you gotta have that tension. You gotta have those different points of view. Right. And, um, and otherwise, because otherwise it's just, I think it comes out flat. Um, you know, that, that was actually kind of funny. You know, early on, we're going after these opposing voices and you, Sean, you're like, no, I don't want to interview that person. We're not paid to have that guy on there. And Josh is like, we got to get him. I got, I got to do it. So I had to trust Josh's instinct on this and let him go do it. And it really adds a real powerful dynamic to the film to have that contrast in there and let people make up their minds because we're not, we don't say anything bad about them. We just let their voice be heard. So if you're a skeptic, I think it's genius because your voice gets heard. You, you hear your voice in those peoples and it allows you to drop your wall as a viewer and a voyeur. 
so that when God begins to move, your heart is open to be able to receive that even more so, I think. So um, anyway, thank you for trusting us with some of that you know, along the way because it was hard to do. I really admired that for you because I know you were resistant on a lot of levels, but you also okayed it and green-lighted it as we presented it. Well, and it, it, for me, I think it, what was difficult is it's like, I don't want to give these guys any more airtime. Like, I feel like they, yeah. you know, like that's where I was coming from. It wasn't yeah. that I was scared of what they were going to say right. or that I didn't feel, I thought they were going to expose me. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, was, it wasn't that. It was just that I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want these guys to have any more, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Like, but at the, at the same time, it kind of exposes them. And that's what I feel like at the yeah. end of the day. I mean, here we are, it's 2022. We're looking back, everything we were told as we were conspiracy theorists, we we're queuing on people, we're right. believing all this stuff. Like everybody, everybody now <laughs> that was deemed that has now been proven true on multiple issues. You know, this, yeah. they've admitted that masks don't work. They've admitted that, you know, I mean, I won't get into all of it, but it's like interesting how farther you come away from that, how crazy some people looked. Yeah, for sure. Right. And For I sure. think that it was like, there was just something that came over people. It was just like, right. they're not acting right. Like, yeah, there's, there was like a mass, what is it? Mass formation psychosis is what they were saying. Yeah. Just right. the amount of fear, people couldn't think clearly. Right. Got in real protective mode. It was a bizarre time. And I think this film brings really the antidote to that, which is courage and yeah. faith. Right. It yeah. flies in the face of all that. And I, I feel like people are walking away from this with a dose of that in their heart and their lives. They're able to take this away and to not let fear dominate their world. You know? yeah. Well, there's so many things, so many themes in this movie. Like there's the rise of suicides and depressions. There's Christian nationalism. Right. There's obviously COVID. Um, but I think that one of the things that's people after seeing the film have said to me is like, oh, I'm actually still thinking about this. Like the next day, you're still thinking about it. Um, because there's so many things to unpack from 2020. It was, I think 2020, there was so much that just came at us. And so um, I think collectively where we are as a nation is it's just like, what do we just go through? <laughs> How do we unpack this? And I think what I tried to do in the film and what we tried to do in the film was hit a bunch of those issues by following your storyline. Like you're the kind of the, the lead character that's guiding us through the, like this, this journey. Um, but in the process, we're hitting all these different topics and, and sort of reliving 2020 right. um, in a way that uses you as kind of like this, this main character that's leading, leading us through it. Where, where, do you, where do you guys feel like this sits as like a historical piece? I've been thinking a lot about that. And, and I feel like first and foremost, it's a historical piece for the church. Right. Yeah. And for Bible colleges and for missionaries to be able to look back and go, okay, this is how you respond in faith in times of crisis, at minimum. Yeah. But I think nationally, it's, it's for America, it's, part of, it's going to be part of America's story. You know, yeah. I think our foundation, our foundational roots are Judeo-Christian values, and we're seeing an erosion of that. And to be able to look at a time where there's so much cultural erosion, when they, too much government control, for the church to be able to step in and rise up in faith and in love in a season like this, I think, uh, I think this film is going to have really long legs, and I think people are going to look back on it, and it's going to be a historic piece. Wow. Kind of is a little bit of PTSD watching this thing, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. George Floyd stuff. I mean, like, there's some heavy stuff in there. Yeah. And, and even just the weight spiritually, I mean, there was a lot of supernatural warfare we experienced just right. making this film. Right. There's a bunch of weird things happening, and um, it's a weighty film. But I, I think with any film like that, it's, it's important. I think it's, I believe it's important to where we are as a nation. Right. And what is it, Kairos versus Kronos? Right. Like the time, I don't know, I'm going to butcher this, but Kairos is might be God's story. Yeah. Is that yeah. Kairos? Yeah. And Kronos is like the slice of where we are now. And I think that coming out of 2020, we've just been so focused on the Kronos, yeah. or like the small bit, that when we zoom out and we see with this film particularly, it's like how it sits in the grand scheme of things. 
I believe God's, God's using it in that bigger scheme to help people talk about this stuff and decompress, but also like, I think it speaks to where we are as a nation um, in that grand scheme of things. So it's not just a documentary. I mean, for me, it's, it's a bigger, I don't know, like picture of where America is. Um, but that just might be my ego talking. <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you guys feel like when it comes to, like the, the battle for narrative, right? I mean, this is what we're living in right now. Like who's gonna control the narrative, Yeah. you know? And the politicians fight over it and the business guys fight over it. And it's like, yeah. it's like whose narrative will reign supreme. Yeah, right. You know, I was thinking about that as we were just worshiping in Times Square and how it's like- the Most distracted places. Yeah, the most distracted places yeah. in the world. And it's like, everything's vying for your attention. Everyone wants control of your thoughts, your mind, your emotion. It's like, we're always, you know, some, but somebody is taking our our attention and our focus. And yeah. I feel like we need people in the entertainment industry, in the in the, in the film industry, to tell the stories, yeah. to tell the God stories, because yeah. they're out there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what do you guys see as you you've engaged in that world a whole lot more than me? What's happening right now in that in that in that place? Well, I'll say one of the reasons I'm in this is because as a kid, when I grew up, I wanted to be in the mafia. <laughs> and I say people laugh, but it's because I was discipled by Martin Scorsese right. and Al Pacino, yeah. Robert De Niro and gangster rap, all this stuff in the 90s, because I didn't grow up in a church. Yeah. So I was discipled by all this content that was pumping at me. I saw a vision of a worldview that gave me like, some kind of context that gave me a version of what looked like unconditional right. love, people willing right. to lay down their lives for each other. And so when I got saved, I just had this passion. I was like, where are those that are telling God's stories in a relevant way so that the next generation can look up and go, man, I want to be like that. Right, yeah. You know, I want to see that. And, and so I've had this theory about, okay, what's the most influential thing in our, cult in our culture? And I've kn known it to be media and films, but it's just been this idea until I met with George Barna. Barna does more research than any other group on the yeah. planet as it relates to church trends, why people are leaving the church or pastors struggling with this, whatever. And I said, hey, have you ever done a study on what's the most powerful thing in our culture for transformation of the culture in America? And he goes, oh, absolutely. I've done a study. There's three tiers of cultural influence. In the, third, in the first tier, which is the most influential in transformation of culture, he's identified seven things. Five out of those seven are media related. The other one is pu uh, public policy and law. The last one is family. Over on the third tier, you have the church down at the bottom. Wow. And I was like, so gripped because I'm like, the, I'm the church. This is me, you know? Right. And so, but yet we are literally have been entrusted with the greatest stories the world's ever yeah. known. Right. We just don't quite have the skill set. We haven't had the skill set. I, I don't think they'd be able to tell it in that kind of context, yeah. or we've been afraid of it in some way. Right. And people are spending 11 hours a day in front of screens. And you said it today, it, it let us worship in Times Square. You become what you behold. Yeah. And if our kids are beholding screens for that many right. hours, right we have to be telling these stories in front of them. It's gonna give them context and language and, and faith and all these things. Yeah. And so now is the most important time for the storytellers to arise, yeah. you know, in this space, in the marketplace, in film and television and social media, super important. Well, I, I, I mean, it's just like anything. I feel like, and, and, and sometimes conservatives are the worst to just to be honest, because, you know, and I, I can be like that where it's like, I don't want my kids on screens and I, we, you know, unplug, unplug. We do that as much as we can, obviously they're, yeah. they do a lot. They travel, they see the world. They, I take them hunting. We do all kinds of stuff. However, what's interesting is that a lot of times we have an escapist mentality where it's just like, I'm not going to go to the theater. I'm not going right. to, I'm not going to get on Instagram. I'm, I'm cutting everything out. And I'm like, well, you can do that, but the whole world's still going there. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. You and 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 there's an opportunity there for us to capture an audience that doesn't know God, that doesn't understand, you know, like it's it's like a mission field kind of. Totally. 100%. And in so many ways we've we we've, we've relegated that space. And even for me, like I don't go watch movies. Yeah. Like ever. I go with my mom over Christmas time. Yeah. Or my family. Yeah. You know, like I just don't go. But now movies are roaring back, you know? Yeah. And of course you got Top Gun and biggest of all time or whatever. Um, 
and people are going back and it's something that people are getting back in the habit to and 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 why shouldn't we be telling the stories well i'll tell you why because it's so expensive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and it's costly and it takes a lot of time and energy and work yeah. you know you can't just throw something together and get it up there and hope that you can battle with the, the best of them you know but what is your thought josh on that like well so i'm going to pose a question to you guys i'm actually curious why was the passion of the christ the most successful film like so obviously it's like jesus's story but like right. why do you think it was the most successful we'll call it christian film one of the most successful of all time is it's the most su successful rated R film of all time. Yep. That's for sure. I think it's the most successful because it's the most entertaining. Like there's this disconnect with Christian filmmaking where it's, oh, we gotta be safe or we gotta like, you know, the fashion of the Christ. It's not like, safe. <laughs> there's like <laughs> whipping. It's like, there's blood. There's like, it's entertaining. It's gnarly. And I think, you know, what one of the things that I'm trying to do as a filmmaker, or just like as a, as a young filmmaker, as a growing filmmaker, is to actually recognize that the whole point of the movie, of like watching a movie, is to be entertaining. But there's a way to mix art and not just information. Like there's there has to be this this focus of just let's just make good movies again, not just like let's play it safe. Um, and the more that we can focus on, for me, like, tell me what you guys think of this, but this, like as an artist, um, the more that I can just focus on making the best story that I can, yeah. or just telling the best story, and focusing less on just like, oh, this is some Christian thing, how can I make this the most entertaining? Right. How can I make this the most engaging? Yeah. And I think that that's, the dis that's what I think is the disconnect with sort of like what we're talking about, is people are focusing on you know, all the, the safe things you're supposed to do are checking, checking all the boxes instead of just, how can you tell a good story? Yeah, well, I think, I think a lot of Christian films have been made by pastors, and so their pastor's job is to teach, for the most part. And I think a lot of Christian films have a teachy, preachy message to it. You feel that. Whereas Passion of the Christ, you don't feel like you're being taught anything. Right. You're a voyeur watching this story take place, and it's not safe, right? Yeah. Jesus wasn't safe. Yeah. He goes, I'm sending you out lambs amongst wolves. Ain't nothing right. safe about that, right? right? And so I think to your point about safety, I think we need to, we need to be willing to take risks as believers yeah. in, in storytelling and also not be, I feel like you have to teach everybody everything. Jesus didn't lay everything out there. He told yeah. parables yeah. and let it be, yeah. right? And let, it says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Come discover this. Here's the mystery. Right. There's a mystery to this thing again. Where there's a lot of films, Christian films, we just laid it all out there. This is the message, and here's the three crosses, and you got to come to come to Christ right now. Which those films have a purpose and a place. I just think you need to know the difference between right. art and entertainment and storytelling versus a message that's very evangelistic. Well, right? I think with Super Spreader, I mean, that's it's raw, man. <laughs> like I wanted to leave all the the cursing in there and like all like just the raw emotion because it's like that's what oh, happens there's a lot in there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pg-13 could have been our real easy yeah but like thanks to but not straying away from that stuff right. and just embracing it um and i think that that's what we that was the approach with super spreader was we wanted just to take a risk you know i mean that that was you know why i was attracted to this is it's just like how can we take a risk with this how can we step out and and tell the story yeah. in a way that's not just one-sided or right. just from, I don't know, just like playing it safe point of view. But that's just not your, that's just not your MO as a, <laughs> as a human. But to be true to your story, but also not to, to cut corners or not to right. um, just go with whatever is gonna be, you know, the most widely accepted. Well, you know, I think, What's so funny even about this story is it's unashamedly revival and, and there's a lot of conflict, there's a lot of emotions, there's whatever. But I mean, we, the Christian film industry, so many of them wouldn't get on board because of the name. <laughs> right. They want us to change the name Super Spreader. I mean, this is how crazy these people are. Lettuce right? Worship Documentary. Yeah, like, the... let's call it lettuce, <laughs> the Lettuce Worship Documentary. Yeah, that sounds real appealing. You know. And, and yet at the same time, Cinemark, Regal, uh, and, uh, and, MC, and, MC. and AMC were like, yeah, the name's great. We love that. 
I mean, that's kind of what blows my mind. Like, how are Christians like? They're so worried. I'm so like, worried. To are you gonna like? Wrong. If you yep. see, if you see a yeah, that, yeah, like the title come up, you're on a plane or on Netflix or something. Let us worship documentary. I mean, it's like, <laughs> but super spreader. Like, hey, that's kind of like intriguing. Yeah. And I think that even we've exposed how this film has not has been rejected by a lot of those True. people, and it goes to show you why they they're in the place that they're in. You know. Yeah. It's funny, I think people are going to see this film, like, I think the expectation is maybe watching the trailer or coming into this. Once people see this film, the reaction has been so different than, I think there's going to be a lot of people that are going to watch this, that are going to come in one way yeah. and leave another, or just like the expectation, like like the name. Right. Um, I think that there's, this thing packs a punch, and I think that, the people that we've been talking to that have seen the film, I mean, we've been getting standing ovations in movie theaters. Like, yeah. when was the last time? I mean, I guess, I don't know. I just haven't been to a, a film that's like, had a standing ovation in a while. You know, I think people resonate with it, but I also think that it's time to like start, like this is the charge. I feel like this is a little bit of the, the spearhead of, we need more films like this. We need more bold people to, to yeah. take risks and come out of their shell yeah. and stop playing it safe with with music, with yeah. film. Um, but I don't know. Well, one of, one of the things I feel like um, is it allows people as well, this is my prayer, and I've actually been preaching this too, and, and going into communities and places where people, maybe they didn't feel like they responded the best in the COVID season, mm -hmm. but maybe they have shame around that. They're like, oh man, I, I was free far, I was whatever. Well, it doesn't do any any good to come in and be like, you sucked, and we were better, or whatever. Like, but if you can present something and you can say, this is what happened. Right. You're exposing some of the agendas, the motives, because we go into all that, right? This is what God was doing. Let's take inventory for how we responded. You know, and it causes you to reflect a little bit. Well, what, where was I in that season? Because we go through the moments here that everybody remembers. It was like 2020, 2021, you're turning through the book of Revelation, wondering what page you're on, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. So you, you see it in the, in, in the context and you're like, okay, how did I respond? And you know, if I didn't respond in the, in, in the way that I wished I would have, it's okay because there's another test coming. Right. Yeah, you know, and I think that in some ways, that's what my heart would provoke people to maybe respond differently in the next season. I'm not at, like even the guys, the trolls that we have in there. I'm like I don't. I go I go to sleep fine. I don't think about them. I don't care. It, I'm not like forever offended. Yeah, I could sit down with them and talk to them like this. I don't. But my prayer is that can you see in context that it's kind of crazy why you thought what you thought and why you said what you said. Can you just, so I think that's my heart is that maybe this thing could be an opportunity for people to take an inventory and respond and say, right. next time when this comes, cause it will come again. We've been told already. We're not gonna, we're not gonna be caught in fear and, and, and paranoid and, and we're not gonna let governors do this kind of stuff. And we're, we are gonna be the people of God. For, I'm curious for both of you guys, what's the biggest thing coming out of these two crazy years, not even just with the film, but just kind of where we are, what's what's something that's different? Like that you, that talking about just like shifting perspectives or, or like how have you grown or like what do you think um, with where you are now, what's shifted in your, what have you learned or like how have you, what's something that you was has been unexpected coming out of this season? I mean, I, God, God writes the best stories and he, and he, and he, you know, it's like in the midst of it, you don't, you don't know all the time. And I think we experienced that some in the film when people watch it, you know, your people that you love are against you, leaders that you trust are against you, your own wife at one point is against you. And, but yet you feel like this is what God's doing, but yet you're second guessing yourself all the time as well. But yet you're seeing God move and it's just like, God sees it, you know, the end from the beginning. We just yeah. see in part and knowing at the time not not understanding that that he's written the story and it ends really good yeah and and at the time you, you're just like what is happening and just kind of follow his voice yeah. you know and that's what 
gets me fired up about this and presenting this to the world? Look, I think at the end of the day, um, we're in a real special season. And I think God's creatives are rising up, people with bold faith. You just released a book called Bold. I think that there's, there's a new season of the body coming together. There's been a pruning. And those with the voices of courage and faith are stepping forward. And we're in such a unique time. We've got a movie, movie about revival hitting 600 theaters. <laughs> I mean, that's not normal. Yeah. You know, that's a miracle. The time frame, how we got it done is a miracle. And so I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And so I think, you know, so that we can see a lot more of that, y'all need to come out and support it starting September 29th, this coming Thursday. Thursday. Uh, majority of theaters, about 300 of them, one night only. Yeah. We got about 200 are going to show them for about a week. So if you go to superspreaderfilm.com, click get tickets, you can find out your city, see where it's at. And uh, we need to support these kind of films so we can have more of them and send a message to Hollywood that we need to hear more God stories. Yeah, come on. Yeah. All right, superspreaderfilm.com. Y'all got directions. We'll see you on Thursday.